Hello, everyone, and welcome again. Very, uh, very good afternoon to you all, and welcome to this webinar, which has been curated with an in house lawyer in mind. My name is Gloria Tenjara, and I'm the chairperson of the ELS in house lawyers committee, and your host for today's discussion. Today, we get to discuss corporate governance and the role of the in house council, that is, the company secretary, in pushing corporate governance agenda. Corporate governance is at the core of everything we do. But how intentional are we in practicing it? That's what we're going to find out today. We have two esteemed corporate governance professionals with us today that will guide us through our reflection on corporate governance. Please make use of the chat room and the Q&A channel to send in your questions during the discussion. Before we dive in, permit me to recognize the presence of our panelists who I will now introduce. I will start with Jane Okot Langoya, who is a chartered governance professional and a corporate governance consultant. She is the chairperson ICSA Uganda branch, which covers the East Africa region. Jane is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrator, an organization that champions good governance practices provides qualifications, training, and resources to members and governance professionals worldwide. She is an IFC certified corporate governance trainer and has participated in board induction, orientation, training, and evaluation of a number of boards. Jane is currently a senior faculty member at ICS member, 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 member. training chartered governance professional and chartered company secretary students in the corporate governance and the boardroom dynamics modules. She is also a, a facilitator in the ICSA Uganda workshops in conjunction with the Uganda Law Society. Previously, Jane was company secretary for five years in Kenyara Sugar Works Limited and for eight years in National Housing and Construction Company Limited. She was a board member in Housing Bank, Finance Bank, where she chaired the risk committee and was member of Committee on Asset and Liability Management. She is a member of the Institute of Corporate Governance Uganda, where she was among the founder council members. She holds a master's degree in business administration, a certificate in charter, for chartered governance professional, and a, a diploma in legal practice from the Law Development Center, and an honors degree in law from Makere University. Welcome, Jane. Thank, thank you, Gloria, for your kind introduction. Thank you. Welcome. Our next speaker is Rita. Rita Kabatunzi is a practicing advocate and chartered governance professional employed as a company secretary for Stanbic Uganda Holdings and its subsidiaries, including Stanbic Bank. She is the immediate past company secretary and head legal for Vision Group. Her career in corporate practice spans over 15 years. She held additional roles as risk overseer and strategy officer at Vision Group between 2014 to 2017. Rita is a fellow of the Chartered Governance Institute, founding member ICSA Uganda branch, and a member of the Africa List, a mentorship platform for emerging leaders in Africa. She is a member of the East African and Uganda Law Societies and an alumnus of the OXID Executive Leadership Program at the National Institute for Transformation Uganda. She is an accredited trainer for International Finance Corporation with training and consultancy experience in Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, and previously tutored for the ICSA Professional Qualifying Scheme on Corporate Secretarial, Corporate and Business Law, Corporate Governance, and Strategy. She's currently pursuing a doctorate in Business Administration at Walden University, undertaking research on entrepreneurship and innovation in tours and travel, SMEs in Uganda. She holds an honorary doctorate in business administration, master's in business administration, and a bachelor of laws from Makere. Welcome, Rita. Rita, do we have you? Thank you, Gloria. Okay. So to, to start off um, our conversation today, I would like to, before we get into the nitty gritty details of what corporate governance is, 
I would like us to start with a little bit of background information. Um, Jade and Rita, you, have, you each have professional qualifications and work experience in the COVID governance area. Um, can you speak to why this is an area of interest to each one of you? Like, what did you really see in this area that uh, compelled you to work in this field? If we could start with Jade and then Rita, give, give us your remarks. Jen, over to you. Or Rita, we can start with you. Can you hear me, Jen or Rita? Yes. Did you hear the question? Sorry, we seem to be having a bit of a technical issue. Jen, can you hear us? Rita? Yes. yes. Sorry about that. I, I think my system went off, so I ran for the phone, which is my backup. But I'm back now. Okay. Yes, I back. had your question about the interest of like what inspired me into corporate governance. Can you hear me, Gloria? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you now. Okay. okay. And I can see you. Yeah. You can. You can see me. Yes, I can. Please proceed. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the one person that inspired me to corporate governance was my But he's, uh, I've changed to my phone now. He's the- Recording in Joseph progress. Oloka, the law school, the law school uh, professor. He taught us company law and uh, when he finished the topic on company secretary, I was hooked. And then my first workplace, Kinyara Sugar Works, where I worked in the company secretarial department, I was taken through the ICS course and, disco and discovered eventually that being a secretary is not just about minute writing or making tea for the board members and all that. It's about strategic leadership, the secretary as the invisible leader, subtle leadership through co influence and how the secretary is the center of corporate governance. So that is what got me hooked into corporate governance. Thank you, Gloria. Great, Great Jen. What about you, Rita? What, what got you hooked? Um, Gloria, can you hear me just to confirm? I can hear you. Great, great. I think for me, you'll just allow me to keep my video off for as long as I can. I, I think that might help. Um, I think for me, I just was very interested in, in a field that merged business and uh, law. I was not intent on, on, on uh, just uh, sort of doing corporate law. I wanted to know what business administration was like. And therefore, the course that, um, that, that the profession that seemed to be closest to that was company secretarial and at the heart of that was corporate governance so I was just very interested in something a bit broader than, than the usual you know straight jacket approach to practicing law so that that's what hooked me in the beginning thank you okay great background so um Jane um let's go a little bit into the topic of, the topic for today and I'd like us to start with um, defining it what is corporate governance? How would you simply uh, define it for us? Okay, thank you, Gloria. I'll, there's a gentleman called Bob Tricker. He's referred to as the father of corporate governance because corporate governance came up in the late 80s and early 90s when there were the corporate scandals that led to crashes of those stock exchanges in the 
developed economies. He really simplified what corporate governance is. He said, whereas management is about running business, governance is about seeing to it that the business is run properly. So the realm of corporate governance is really at the board level and senior management who are then accountable for the people who appointed them. That's for the shareholders at uh, company level or for government, you have the, the government uh, parliament or auditor general to account to on behalf of government. The King Code of South Africa, which is widely used in Africa, brings in the component of ethical and effective leadership in the definition of corporate governance. And the definition is that corporate governance is ethical and effective leadership towards achievement of ethical culture, good performance, effective control and legitimacy. And the, there are four principles that we call the overriding principles of corporate governance. That's responsibility, accountability, transparency, and fairness. Responsibility relates to the power that the board or the governing body has been given. The exercise or lack of exercise of that power attracts either liability or, or good, good rewards to where your responsibility is. The people who bear the responsibility for that power are accountable to those who appointed them. So that's where the accountability comes in. Then transparency relates to, I like to simplify it in this manner. Your books of accounts and all these other performance reports, is that what is reflected on the ground? If it is or not, that reflects your level of transparency. Then fairness relates majorly to the minorities within your setting. If you are a company, and you have minority shareholders. Decisions made should never be to the detriment of the share, uh, minority uh, and yet to the benefit of the majority. So the, and for government related bodies, you have stakeholders, they are key stakeholders, they are minor stakeholders. You should never make decisions that favor the majority or the major people at the detriment of the minority. So in a very brief statement, that's what corporate governance is about. So Jane, if, if, I was to, if I was to ask you to sum it up in just one sentence, so that everyone on this call, at least if they forget everything else, they remember just that one sentence, what is corporate governance? Like, what is that little, what are those keywords that we have to keep in mind when we're thinking corporate governance? If I don't remember fairness, in one, sentence, mm. in one sentence, corporate governance is ensuring that the operations of the organization are carried out in an ethical manner. It's about ethical business operations. So ensuring that, say that again the, for me. I know ensuring, that ensuring that the operations, mm -hmm. ensuring that the operations or the businesses of the organization are carried out in an ethical manner. Ethics, Great. ethical business is the underlying principle of corporate governance. Great. So drawing from that, Rita, why should we care for corporate governance? Like what is that thing that, fine, we now know what it is, but why should we care? Because um, if you do not care for corporate governance, the chances that your business will outlive um, you, maybe the founder or the, the first successful group is very, very slim. Uh, corporate governance, I like what Jen has said and to just sort of build on that. I, I like King Four as well. He's, he's really simplified uh, this concept and said, look, corporate governance is really at the heart is value creation in a sustainable manner. I love that statement because it encompasses all the things that people would usually find important. A big part of that is there's performance, but performance must be done in a way that is sustainable. So um, there's a lot of debate about corporate governance. Does it really change uh, things? Does it really improve performance? I'll tell you what most people are agreed on. 
it allows your business to thrive and continue. And, and in continuing, I think there's no person who's doing business who does not want to have their business live you know, on for years. We know the statistics around small businesses, for example, or the standards of the larger organization. So we should all care because no one invests their money for short term. Everybody wants a healthy business that thrives on. And uh, corporate governance is actually what helps you with that. And to, to put it in context, um, a lot of people, when you talk about corporate governance, they think about what we call the normative side of corporate governance, which is you put in place policies, codes, poly, um, you know, all those uh, types of things. What is helping you to thrive in your business is the behavioral side of corporate governance. It's, it's what the board is driving. It's what management is ensuring is being done in the interest of shareholders and stakeholders. So uh, that's why you should care because no one runs a business for it to end tomorrow. We all want it to, to thrive. So corporate governance is at the heart of that. I, I, I love the way you put it, value creation, sustainability, but most important, it's about our behavior because it's the culture that drives and ensures sustainability of our businesses. I love that. So as um, just taking, taking, taking from that now, we now know what it is. We now know why we should care. Uh, Jane, what's happening, on the, on the, what's happening with the trends? How has, how has corporate governance um, evolved and what do we need to know? What do we need to be aware of? You're still on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, thank, no, you, this is thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Gloria. We are getting to this session of a season of activism, especially by shareholders. It's more loud in the developed countries, but it's slowly creeping in. We have a few people who have mobilities like uh, the Ugandans will understand that. Uh, kind of attitude towards there we have a, a, a lawyer who is in a public public uh, interest lawyer so he just sues anybody for anything but we have shareholders and we, uh, who are getting onto that as well in uk it's quite in the developed countries it's quite active now the shareholders have power through their vote. So they get to a point where they can actually use their vote to make the directors do what it is that they want. And to an extent that could, could be arm twisting because shareholders are able to reject resolutions. Shareholders are able to vote out directors. Now the major issue that the activism is uh, surrounding these days is what we have the acronym as ESG the environment, society, and governance. For environment, we have issues of climate change and what corporate governance define uh, environment as is the air, water bodies, and the land. We have stakeholders who need to be mapped. The activists are usually part of those stakeholders. They have low power on the organization, at very high interest into what your activity is doing to the environment. For Kenya, we remember Wangari Mathai, who was, a, I think, a global environmentalist. Now we have a young 25-year-old Elizabeth Wathulti in Kenya. In Uganda, we have a young Vanessa Nakato, Leonidas Zijimpa. is a conversationist champion in Burundi who won the national geographic awards. These activists, when they speak, the public listens. So if your activity is ruining the forest or messing the lake or some river, they are able to recruit the rest of us, the public who usually have no interest. And that can paralyze the organization because we can boycott. So the shareholders are part of this public, they listen to that and they bring in to, uh, they bring to bear to the directors that we want activities that are friendly to the environment. Or if they are not, you have mitigating factors 
to make sure the environment is protected. Then society, they're also looking at what is it that the impact of our organization has on the society around us and also what is it are we doing to improve the life of the community around us. And this is where the social corporate responsibility comes in, covers mainly the society and the environment. You'll find organizations building schools, health centers or hospitals, because as King Code, uh, the King Code states, a company or an organization is a legal person, a legal citizen within the or community that they are staying in. So they have got to comply with the laws and rules and regulations of that community, but also the activities need to take care of the environment and the society around them. Then the governance issue relates to enhanced board effectiveness because board effectiveness translates to good corporate governance within the organization. And this relates to the board composition. Is your board comp uh, composed with the relevant skills, knowledge, and experience that is required by this organization? Refreshment, how are your boards staying on the board forever? Or are they like the company's access staying for the three years or like the many statutes that set up these boards? Three years, maybe renewable once, and then you refresh because we need new blood onto the board as because things are changing as well. Then board evaluation. Does the board have appraisal at the end of every year to find out what it can do better and how it can do that? And that would lead to improved performance of the organization. So the company is not an island. It's got to look after its environment and the society and to make sure the board is following through corporate governance. So that's our major trend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, for that, uh, for that summary. So from what I understood, the trends today are more uh, looking at the environmental side of things, the social impact that, of, of things, and also board effectiveness. Um, now we know this from a global standpoint of view, but how does this now apply in our own entities? And this is where I would like to hear from Rita. As a company secretary, how, does the, how do you ensure that the board is on top of its corporate governance um, you know, duties? How does it make sure that, or how do you help them make sure that they are, they're doing what they need to do in line with what they have decided to, is, 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 a, is the direction for them to take with, with regards to corporate governance? Um, thanks, Gloria. I think to answer that, allow me to give some context. Um, we have very many people on the call, 320 from, from what I can see. Uh, our boards are at different stages, right? Uh, the boards are not at the same stage. Uh, one of my one of those authors that I really look to um, is called Ram Sharan. He he wrote a book on on, on boards that deliver. I, I would encourage anyone you know who's interested in governance to read that book. So what Ram Sharan starts off by saying is your boards should should be a means for competitive advantage. Is an uninteresting. You know everybody thinks about the CEO being the, the you know the source of competitive advantage, but Ram Sharan says look. Your boards should be running the entity and should themselves be running with practices that make them a source of competitive advantage. Now, to do that, you have to consider that your board may be in initial stages, uh, mid or latter stages. So Ram Sharan has these three categories that I think are very easy to remember. So the first one is a ceremonial board. If you have a ceremonial board, it doesn't matter what I tell you about, you know, all these wonderful things that that, that you can do as a company secretary. Your board has a culture in that case of rubber stamping. Uh, the board meetings are very formal. It's, it's just come, let's get things done. What do you need approved? And off we go. If you think about a lot of the smaller entities and apologies for anyone on this call who does run a small business, we, we all do. Uh, but if you think typically about what that board does, it's not there to really push uh, you know, purpose or performance. It's there to sign things for uh, papers to be filed. That's a ceremonial board. Um, Ram Sharan says, then there is a liberated board. The liberated board is one that understands the importance of governance. It really does. 
However, the individuals, the directors are more important. They see themselves, each director sees themselves more important than the whole. It's not the board as a whole that's running. So they understand governance, but I think my skills are better than the next person's. You know, I think the CEO should listen to me, should write the reports the way I want it. You know, that's the liberated board. It's on its way, but it's not quite there. And then there's the progressive board. This is the board, and Jen gave us a very good list of these board practices. You can do your board evaluation, and it's nothing more than a document that is put up on a counter. That's very possible, you know, because it's just a tick box exercise. Maybe your regulator requires it, your shareholder requires it. Uh, it's not really meant to change the way you operate. Um, you, but if you're a progressive board, you actually relish the opportunity to assess yourselves and say, how best could we structure ourselves to do well? Um, and, and, and so as I go into what could a CS do, I take my own experience either as a, a CS who has helped small businesses, who has been in a state corporation, and I saw a common pop-up of state corporations, uh, you know, who's done an SME, and who's done now a market leader. Depending on where you're sitting, and, and it's important to have this context, you, you may not be able to take everything and make it work, but take this with that pinch of salt that you know there is stages and you can do certain things at different stages. So when we talk about trends, for example, a big trend has become the focus on purpose. And Jen has touched on this with, um, the discussion on, on the society, the community, a lot of entities, including uh, Ugandan entities, Kenya and East Africa, are more interested now in why they exist. So um, there is a move away from just coming and, you know, sort of handing off a check and saying, oh, you know, we've helped, to are we really impacting lives? How would the board know that, except if the information that's coming to the board is actually tailored to make that possible? That is the role of the company secretary. The company secretary ceases to just be a person who gets the board papers through and says, we hit the deadline to are these papers actually what they're supposed to be? If, if I'm one day late, that's my own philosophy. If I'm one day late, but my paper is really good and is going to help this board understand that we are doing X, Y, Z and allows our board to give us guidance and use their skills to improve us, then I think that the company secretary is actually helping the board moving in these trends. Um, another catchphrase used a lot is shared value. Shared value is a lot of communities, again, to Jen's point on ESG and all that. A lot of companies are moving away from you just going and shaking hands and you know donating uh, foodstuffs to what are you sustainably doing to improve this community? That is shared value. You're getting something as a, as a company. We are also getting something as the people surrounding you. Now, if that shared value is to be understood by a board, we need to remember that the board is comprised of independent non-executive directors who are not immersed in the business. There has to be an understanding that there is a need for collaboration as opposed to us and them we and they, that is a move away from what was a traditional approach where it was, you know, and, and, and this is sometimes controversial, but I'm going to say it because it causes for good discussion. You know, when do you know that there's been interference between the board and management? When we had the COVID pandemic blow up, how separate were we? Were we still that separate or were we actually very collaborative? You will find that a lot of the discussions around how corporate governance has changed has been that there is a lot more collaboration between the board and management. That, however, can only happen if the company secretary is managing the board dynamics, um, um, managing the board dynamics and helping the board and management to see themselves as joined. Many of the company secretaries on this call will be executives. When you sit in your executive meetings and discussions are taking place, are you guiding management on what would be good information to couch and actually take up to the board for the discussions that could lead to real life changing discussions and decisions? A company secretary, as Jen said, is no longer the tea maker, okay? It's no longer just the person who's taking the record. The company secretary is actually now at the heart, and, and Jane knows this, this is a, 
uh, research that ICSA has done is a strategic thinker. A company secretary must look at the agenda they are developing with the board and not be so concerned with just having items, but with why do we need these items here? What are they going to help us to focus on and actually deliver on? Um, that's, that's the emerging role of a company secretary. The company secretary is a network builder and a relationship builder. That is because there is not such a separateness as we have had in the past. Um, if these emerging trends are to be sort of embraced, let's talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Everyone talks about data, 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 digital, digitizing. Um, these are often complex processes for the board because the board is not involved in operations. How does the company secretary actually prepare their board to understand these things? What is your board development like? Um, when you're picking someone to come and speak, if you're picking uh, Jane to come and speak uh, because she's from ICSA and she has all this information, how much do you prepare her to actually have a real board development session with your board as opposed to tick a box and say, my board was trained? Because this board has to oversee a transformation and a journey that is quite complicated and has to understand it. So the company secretary is that person who's saying, look, the trend is towards digital transformation. IT data and governance is key. How do I skill the board? Then how do I advise the board so that the board is able to actually, you know, um, take on the decisions they need to take on? Uh, does the board know the trends? Does the board know that companies are now thinking more and more about structuring their committees differently than they were structuring them? That is the role of the company secretary. If you compare that company secretary to the one, you know, many of us when we started off knew about, um, very, very different, very, very different. And, uh, you know, I just thought I'd, I'd throw in this challenge to the lawyers, and I'm a lawyer, so don't shoot me. Um, and, and Jen would be very happy that I say this, she's taught me well, that if you are, if you're wearing your legal hat all the time and you're not remembering the business hat, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to help your board walk along these trends because the trends are here and they're not going to change. Data governance is not going away. Sustainability is not going away. Diversity and inclusivity are not going away. Are they on your agenda? Does your chair know how to navigate? Does your board know how to discuss? And does management know how to package that information to help this board? Remember, Ram Sharan, who I, I absolutely think has nailed it, says, your boards can be a source of competitive advantage, but the company secretary is the person who's going to make that possible. So, yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll sort of throw that in as, as, as we think about these trends, do not think about them as something separate from the role that we are performing every day. It's not unique things. It, it's not, you know, someone asking you to go study some complicated courses, but a pragmatic approach is key. A company secretary has to have a more pragmatic approach than they've had in the past. Yeah. I I, I feel there's a lot to unpack. I don't know where to start with all <laughs> with all the information you've given us today. Uh, but uh, maybe just to bring it a little bit home for us. Um, again, as you said, most of us our boards are, are different and are different stages, including even our companies. They also are different stages. Like, how would you really break it down for us? Those of us who've not had an opportunity to, to see things from where you have explained them or described them. Like, like what are those examples? Or the, can you give us examples of, um, of things you had to do to show that um, you understood your role as a company secretary, not to be that of a minute taker only, but of somebody who's a strategic thinker in this case? Like what examples can you give us? It could be one or two that highlight it for us so that when we go back to our roles, we, we sit back and say, eh, I've been doing a lot of nothing. <laughs> like I really need to revise what I think my role is as a company secretary. If you could just break it down for us. Rita. Rita. Okay. Okay, um, and, and I'm sure Jen can chip in here because I know that ICSA has been doing quite a bit of work in preparing company secretaries uh, to, to change and to evolve into that kind of, of thinking. 
I, I'll say, uh, for example, when COVID came around, I was one of those people who was very much separate the roles, there'll be interference. You know, if the board starts having more regular meetings, for example, I was challenged. Um, uh, my chair said, look, if we have all these issues going on and we need to change how we're working, surely we cannot meet only once a quarter. Is, I mean, that doesn't make sense. We, we need to meet more. And at first, my initial instinct was to quote the codes and everything, the best practice around quarterly meetings, right? But um, I quickly realized that from engagements with my chief executive, one of the things I did, and I did mention this about being a relationship builder, is talk to your chief executive. Talk to your chief executive. I, I mean, not everybody has um, the benefit of being able to do that, but if you can, um, to talk to your chief executive, what are the things that are keeping this chief executive up at night? And then do an actual assessment. Are you really, really sure that the way your board is structured is going to help you to do that? In my case, I sat back and I thought, okay, if, if, if we have a crisis, the regulator has said, you cannot do this anymore. And I'm insisting on having uh, what the quarter meetings, how is that going to help management to actually move forward on the decision? So I quickly took the approach of, of learning as I go. And ambiguity is key here. Change is coming at you whether you like it or not. Um, so one of them was to change, accept the change around how our meetings are held. It wasn't easy for me because guess what? It has implications for me. It means I have a lot more administration to deal with. Let's, let's, let's be honest about that. But that was a change that, that I made and that I found endeared management more to the board because the us and we changed a bit because we are working together, right? The other is I had learned about a practice called reverse mentorship. Reverse mentorship is where the management is actually training the board as opposed to the other way around. So I took it upon myself. This is a challenge that I'd heard about that is supposed to help uh, with the digital transformation journey and the understanding that uh, these are technical areas. The board cannot possibly learn about them by just going and attending a good training somewhere. They have to understand how we are structured as a business. And what I did is to read everything I could on reverse mentorship. Uh, find out which companies had actually done that. And benchmarking, again, is very, very key. Uh, found out which companies have done that. Not in, unfortunately, Uganda hadn't done much in that area, but still, what are the risks? You know, what do we need to do to... ...this side of the world. Um, yes, so, so we then changed our approach to board development as well. So our board development is no longer just going for trainings, it's more practical sessions. And, and, and I feel that that has actually helped our board move a long way because the culture of board development has changed significantly. Um, the last one I'll say is how we develop our agendas. I changed how we develop our agendas. Our agendas are not a top-down approach, they are a bottom up approach. I start with the manager. <laughs> Sorry, I've run out of power. So apologies, as long as you can hear me. I hope you can. We hear you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. So, um, yes, yeah. yeah, so the way we develop the agenda has also changed. So it's a, it's a bottoms up. And that means that we focus on the real issues, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I, I, I tell my team all the time, I don't want to see the template we used last, the last uh, quarter. It cannot be that the issues are the same. There has to be something that's different. And so I would say those are examples of how I myself as a company secretary changed. The other one, which I will, I will tickle Jenny to speaking about, because I know her well enough too, is the EQ and the, you know, the emotional intelligence and how that is something that you can actually use to change the group dynamics. Um, very, very key that I had to change and become more socially aware, more relationship oriented. You know, you know that director who you think is difficult um, and learn to take the courses and learn how to know that group dynamics is real 
and that shouldn't um, supersede the overall goal, which is don't get stuck on this one director who's a challenge. I actually found out that many times some of these directors are very highly skilled. So they actually help management a lot. If you can get past this problem of, oh, you know, and, and so what I did is I started arranging in between meetings, um, meetings. I, I, I sponsor breakfasts when I can. And, and I, I get directors to meet sometimes with me and then you have general discussions and all that has helped. So the culture changes, but it's you, the CS, who's helping the, the board to change. So yeah, so I, I think those are the examples I'd give. I'd be interested to know what other people and participants would have to say as well. And Jane, of course, yeah. Jane, you're not running away from this. <laughs> <laughs> Am I still muted? Okay. Uh, thank you. Am I muted? No, okay. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. We've worked closely with Rita for years. She's been in ICSA as vice chair before she, she left. So we, we know each other quite well. Um, just before I go into that, what Rita has asked, I'd like to mention the four main roles of a secretary. One is the governance role. The board is responsible for corporate governance, but is the responsibility of the secretary to ensure that, that the board is actually carrying out their corporate governance role. So one of the areas is in, for instance, the board composition. The secretary needs to be on the lookout. You have, uh, I like giving an example of our law society. It's full of lawyers. So who's looking after the finance? who's looking after the other societal issues, other technical issues. The secretary is supposed to be sharp enough to find that out and say, no, let's have a bit of diversity. Diversity is another of the trends that are coming up. And then the matters reserved for the board have to be documented. So that you don't have management and boards fighting over what to do. And this is supposed to be documented and the secretary, it's a live document, living document, keeps changing and the secretary is responsible for that. Of course, other issues like body insurance, you make decisions now for the next five years. In year four, it backfires. There has to be insurance for the board, especially if they were not negligent. This is the officers and directors, professional indemnity insurance. Board information, the board packs, the uh, board uh, charter, is usually, and the articles are usually very clear. And even the, where the, the, the board is set up by statute, it's very clear when documents should be given to the board. The board, unfortunately, are taken advantage of by management. If you send the documents late, the board accepts, management will just say, ah, that's how the board is. It's up to the secretary, that's your constituency, to make sure these documents are given to them in time because the board's business is in the boardroom. If you are going to give them a thick document at the board meeting, what kind of decision do they expect of them? We have uh, board development and relationships. The board training, corporate governance is evolving. At least like twice a year is the responsibility of the secretary. It takes money, yes, but don't, what's the value add of that money? You have uh, board members that are quite educated. The board dynamics, which has mentioned this, it's the board, it's the secretary that will look after it. This is the, inter, the relationship between the individual directors, the board as a whole, and with management and outside and all that. As Rita mentioned, you usually have those directors that are, we call them stubborn. But as when I was secretary, what I found that there's good in everybody actually, and you can get through to everybody. So like Rita, I would, go to these board members who we all think are difficult. You win their trust. And that's how you're helping with the board dynamics. Because when the, this director understands what it is that you're, you're proposing at the board meeting, they'll support you. And the, the secretary is a strategic leader, but subtle. That means you're not going in front of everybody showing you're a leader, no. The leadership is through influence. So as you talk to these board members, Talk to the CEO as well. I had experience of a CEO and a board member and a chair who did not see eye to eye. 
So the chair would come and say, Jen, this stupid CEO, blah, 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 blah. And I had to convey a message to the CEO. To date, the CEO has never known that the chair called him stupid. So how is it that you package your messages as you communicate? Accountability, the financial statements. We have ICSA, which Rita is part of. Finance, finance, uh, understanding finance, a finance module is one of them. Because secretaries, you do have a part that you sign off in that account. Number two, by the time the secretary hands over board papers to the board, you are telling the board members, these papers are okay. You can start from there so that they bring in the objective judgment. So the secretary has to be a, a jack of all trades and a master of all. You've got to master your finance. Whichever technical field you're in, you've got to master it. I'm sure Rita is now a banker. She used to be a lawyer or, and a media specialist. You've got to be a master of all so that you help the board with their, their job of accountability. It is the secretary that helps the board perform. You are the board's eye on the management team. Then you have um, disclosures and reporting. These reports we give to the board as secretary, are they transparent? Are they reflecting what is on the ground? You are the conscience of the company. You know, when we were young, we had this thing of uh, some of us, some of you are still young, but when I was young, you had the devil or the, the angel on one of each side. I think the angel on the right. So if there's a situation, the devil will say, go ahead, do it, do it. And the angel said, don't, don't. That's the secretary. In the management meeting, you see for sure something is going to put the company in trouble, the board in trouble. What do you do as a secretary? You are the conscience. You are that angel that should look out and make sure these things don't go past. And if they do, you should have the emotional intelligence to handle it in a manner that does not cause ruckus on your board and management as well. And then the, the secretary is also an advisor of both the board and senior management. When issues are brought up, you must speak up. You must speak up if they're wrong. If they're right, you support. And when you win the trust of the board, they will keep asking you. The secretary will not necessarily speak much in the board meeting, but you'll be asked. And usually, if you want the, the measure of your winning trust of the board, whatever you say, the board will go with. There you, you have arrived. In, in Uganda speak, you have arrived. Then the board, the secretary is also a board communicator. You sit there, you watch them, you write the minutes, you know what it is about. It is you to communicate what it is that the board has decided. I know we have cases where the CEO may want to change what is in the minutes. What I used to do, because the minutes are for the board, they're not for management. What I used to do so as not to annoy everybody was to do the minutes, zero draft I sent everybody. So when I have to, when I'm asked to change, I said, but now I've sent to everybody. If it's a major, if it's a minor type, I know that I'll change. But if it's a major thing which I know was not said, I said, please, let's wait for the board meeting because this, these minutes are for the board. Yeah, so you communicate the board's uh, decision as well. And uh, haven't I forgotten the question? I, I think you have given us so many examples to draw from. The question was, what examples can, vivid examples could you give us on how the company secretary actually carries out their role. And I think oh, you've given us so many examples, oh, but, okay. but maybe just to link back to this question, there's, I, I see a question from somebody on the chat who's, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pick one or, few, one or two questions. We'll have time to go to the chat later. But um, somebody's asking, Hadjet is asking that, what happens where the, the CEO is the secretary to the board? How, how does that role get executed? Given the conversation that we're having. Now, that's that question while we're having this discussion. That's the Rich. worst stepping position. <laughs> that's the worst position that a secretary can be in because the secretary, aside from uh, writing the minutes, uh, you are checking out the body language. You are sitting next to the chair. If there is issues with board dynamics, you are able to tell what's happening. You're writing notes to the chair and all that. How on earth are you then going to be the CEO who's presenting? And I've got an example, I've not mentioned the organization, but they would, 
such boards have minute takers because the CEO has to present. Then the CEO will go and change the minutes. And there was a board member who contacted me about that. So what I told him was that, no, you, you need to speak up and have your, your minutes done accordingly. But that is a bad, bad structure. You, the board, the CS, you are the eye of the board in management. CEO is usually one of the worst culprits doing <laughs> things that uh, should be reported to the board once in a while. How do you report yourself? How do you report yourself? So it's the worst position. And whenever I get the opportunity for in, in Uganda with the people, I worked in the Ministry of Justice, I tell them people, stop. You, you, you are turning the secretarial function into clerical work. Because the best the person can do is to get somebody to write what they want, and that's it. But none of these other functions can take place because that independence required of a secretary is missing. Rita, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, um, I, I think John is right. And, and I think the big problem here is if it is, um, and, and I think there's been a lot of state corporations, um, you know, feedback. Uh, in some instances, the structure is set up in such a way that it, it, it actually helps to control power with one person. So it, it would be wrong of us to say, that it can't happen. And that's sort of what Jenny is speaking to ministries and state owned corporations that may happen um, in some NGOs. I've seen it happen as well. Um, and, and, and Jen and I have, have constantly said, look, there's a point at which it's you who decides if, if, if you're in that organization, in that case, you wouldn't be the secretary unless you're the CEO. Uh, the CEO has a vested interest and has generally in many cases swayed the board towards what they want anyway. So the secretary's role is not well understood. And until that is done by an external, whether it's an external consultant or whatever it is, that culture continues because the board thinks the secretary is just a minute taker. And, and, and that's the way it will, it, will, it, will, it will work. But in cases where there's an understanding that the secretary is supposed to be an advisor, especially where the advisory role is taken seriously, um, where the repercussions and directors worry about their liabilities, should they make the wrong decisions, knowing the secretary is the one who helps them to do that, then there will be a separation. So I guess that's a guiding factor. And if we, we tell people all the time, if you're working in an organization like that, you want to decide <clears throat> what do you really want for yourself? Is that where you see yourself, you know, sort of serving? Because you may not be able to change it. There are many minute takers who've complained about that and said, I'm the minute taker, but you know, I'm forced to change things because you know, the CEO is also the secretary and, you know, I do what they want. I will say this, I, I, I not all, in, in some cases, um, there are companies that will listen and will change, but it takes an external, you know, some sort of external force. I also like to challenge people and say, there are cases where the CEO and the secretary are separate and there's still a problem. So let's also acknowledge that if your CEO is dominant, you may be a secretary. Yes, you may be there, but you know, and, and I'm, I bring this up to say the culture uh, of the board is very, very important in that. I've worked in places where my protection was the board because I said, no, I cannot change that minute. This is, and Jen is right, um, where I called a, a committee chairperson once and I said, I would like you to clarify whether this is not the position that was agreed. And I put it on email. And I'll tell you that it wasn't an easy thing to do. But again, we go back to that relationship building and the dynamics. That CEO, CEO and I are still friends, by the way. We're actually still friends. We disagreed. Um, but I said, look, as a professional, I, I, I cannot do that. And so the other challenge to you also as company secretaries is what do you stand for? And is it understood that you are unwilling to compromise on certain things? Because if you are that kind of person, then the CEO knows where the, 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 the back stops. So it's not always, it, the culture can be such that they are separate and there's still a problem, you know? So there's the underlying issue of the dominance and then the strength of the board as a whole. I just thought I would say that as well, because one of the phrases that I've picked up this year 
from a, 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 an author called Patrick Dunn is, is on June, as some people would, 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 would say, is uh, he says, corporate governance is not a straight jacket and it's not a cult. It's not, it, it's not about these grand things you have in your head. Even though they say separate the CEO and the chair, they may be separate in principle, but in reality. And so the challenge to us as company secretaries today is beyond you know, yes, there's a separation, but is there really good governance? Let's delve a bit further than that because there are state-owned corporations where there may be a margin, it's not ideal, but there's enough uh, recognition that we need to be able to do things in such a way that, you know, uh, we are doing things properly. And Jen knows this because a few of those state corporations have come up to ICSA and said, look, could you come and tell us what we need to do? So that's the underlying, that's the normative versus the behavioral. The behavior is the very big problem. That's the real, real problem. Yeah, I just thought I'd say that. Okay, thank you. I, I, I want to bring this a little bit closer to home. We'll be talking about um, the, the CEO who is the secretary. But let's talk about the head of legal who is also the company secretary. <laughs> There's a growing conversation about Nah, this might not be working the way it should. Well, I want to hear your views on this. <laughs> Who's going first? Because, because I don't want to be short, Jen should go first. She's the advocate, and then I'll follow. <laughs> Jen, what do you think about combining these roles? You're on mute. Jen, you're muted. Okay. Okay. Um, the issue about the secretary's position is that it should be independent. By being head of legal, the secretary is conflicted if it comes to anything to do with legal. And we know how legal is cross-cutting across the whole organization. So there's that push in ICSA to separate the two so that the secretary is really independent. The recommended reporting lines is that for governance issues would be to the board, although administrative issues would be to, to, to the CEO because it's a senior management position. So it's usually the main issue is the independence of the secretary. But Rita is a live example, really. So I think she should take it up from there. <laughs> Look, um... I knew it would come back to me, but I just wanted Jen, because ICSA has really actually uh, been at the forefront of this advocating for that separation. And I remember, I think about maybe five, seven years when that came up, there was just a lot of uh, pushback uh, from companies, even in UK where it had started to say, look, this is a very costly affair. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Why, what would this person be doing? Again, because people thought that the company secretary is just writing notes. I'll tell you just as recently as yesterday, it's very interesting. A friend of mine who is in an, um, um, a sort of government body uh, reached out to me and, and, and was asking that, that you know, what, what, are the, what are the grounds or the reasons that we could use to, to actually ask for separation of these roles? Uh, which, which said to me, look, that there's a recognition that um, you, you need to be able to, one, Jen has spoken to the independence, and that's very true. But then there's also the practical aspect of just focusing. If you're doing governance properly, if you're doing it properly, it is a full-time job. Bedding it, all the things we've talked about, relationship builder, networker, you know, reviewing the reports, you know, liaising with management, therefore you're attending many meetings and just making sure that they're having the right conversations and you're building your team. Um, if you're doing it right, then in terms of time, it can be very, very difficult. It can be very difficult to do. And I'll say that for me, that has been a huge benefit of, of, of having the separation because yes, at Stanbic, we have separated the roles uh, and we separated, they were separated. I came in when they separated the roles because the recognition was that both roles are equally important. Now to the person who says there's a cost issue, could you consider company secretary, the company secretary role can be performed by, and, and, and this, is, this is where I think sometimes we get stuck. The company secretary role can be performed by, um, you can groom someone who you think is 
<clears throat> independent enough to actually take on this role. You don't have to go look for the most expensive person. There are some key things that, that, that uh, I think, Jen, I don't know what, I don't want to say how old I was when I became a company secretary, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't the typical, one would say that I wouldn't be considered old enough to advise the board. But I'll tell you in Uganda, I've seen increasingly a younger crop of company secretaries who are known for their integrity, known to be on top of things, who are being given a chance to do that role. And so um, the question around if we join, maybe um, if we separate, it will be too expensive, is not always true. It is a mindset issue first. And that mindset comes from understanding that both roles are important and a recognition and a culture that allows for the independence of that company secretary, because that's really what you're saying, as Jen has said. We're saying this is a person who checks all of us. And, and we talk about board all the time, by the way, but there's also pushback at management level. The company secretary calls out management uh, and, and, and calls them out to the board and amongst themselves. And sometimes even independence at that level is not something that management is willing to take. So absolutely it should be done uh, if in as much as it's possible you can find cost effective ways of doing it it does not always have to be it doesn't always have to be a very expensive affair um, and maybe the next question to the company secretaries here as well is then what does that look like in terms of your succession plan you know if you're in this situation where you have joint roles and you want to say look separate them and your arguments should be pragmatic. So do you have someone on your team that you could be saying, you know, this person can start to perform one of the roles, you know, whichever one it is, are you willing to actually seed power? It's a very powerful role for those who are head legal stroke company secretary. So rather than should we separate or does it make sense? Absolutely it makes sense. However, it's a mindset if issue and it depends on how management sees it, how the board sees it, and whether you've built enough in your team to actually have someone else actually perform the role. I know companies where the company secretary is actually has three or four people maybe sit on different committees and serve as company secretary to sort of grow them into that role. And, and eventually it will be a cheaper way to say, okay, I'm taking on head legal, but there's already someone here who maybe we just need to promote and improve a bit. And we have the separation already. Yeah. And I, I love where this conversation is heading and uh, I, I would want to hear more from uh, our audience just in a little bit. So before we open it up to the audience, please be ready. If you have questions you want to ask us, just one more question for the panelists. Um, as we know, as we know this, this is a webinar that is uh, for in-house lawyers and not every in-house lawyer is a company secretary. But I just want us to, to get a sense of as an in-house counsel, how engaged should we be in corporate governance matters? I like something, I like what Rita said earlier in her background that she didn't want just to do legal matters. She also wanted to understand the business side. So for that company, for that in-house counsel, who, 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 who feels that mm, I don't wanna just do legal matters. How can I also have access to what's happening on the business side? How would you, how would you engage with them? Like, like what do they need to, to hear today in order to, to think of, of, to have a two-pronged approach to their role as in-house counsel, but also as somebody who is, who is in a corporate governance setting and that this also impacts how they make decisions or advise management. Jen, do you wanna first take this and then we can hear from Rita? Okay, thank you. I think first of all, we need to, understand that corporate governance is not this crystal ball like something that's handled by the secretary's department. Corporate governance is cross-cutting throughout an organization. When the board is set up, there's usually an organization purpose. The responsibility of the board is to make sure that purpose translates into organizational success. So the board will set up structures uh, policies, their laws and uh, procedures, and we need compliance. Compliance is a huge component of corporate governance. And many times, you know, the in-house lawyers are following the compliance component. But in order to comply with those things so that eventually we get the organizational success, 
we need to get in the people to, to, to work, to follow the structures, follow the strategies and all that. And that's where I usually say the problem begins. Let, let, let me give an example, uh, which I usually like when people who've listened to my workshops have facilitated know this example, the procurement manager. In government, we have what we call the PPDA, that's the procurement, Public Procurement and Disposal of Assets Act. There's a procurement method called request for quotes, which requires three quotes. So this procurement manager asks his girlfriend for a quote, he asks his uncle for a quote, and he asks his buddy for a quote. Hasn't he complied, Gloria? The request for quotes is three. He has complied. Yes. Technically. So, <laughs> now what governance is about is the ethical component. The spirit of that law is that there should be com competition. So governance is what culture is it that you are creating? The board gives us values. All organizations have values. They are spread out in our boardrooms, there are receptions, integrity, transparency, and all that. Has the board made sure that that is what the culture is? Because the values are supposed to, to the culture is supposed to be aligned to the values. And culture is created by what you let people get away with. So if this procurement manager is getting away with that kind of procurement process, first of all, people say, by the way, CEO is getting part of this, you leave this man and woman, they're untouchable. But secondly, what culture is it? And that's where the secretary comes in, because if the culture is not aligned, that's a governance issue, what needs to be done? But in the, in the process where the culture is brought in, it should be ethical culture. That's what I was talking about earlier the underlying ethical component of governance. If you have ethical culture, then you'll have your organizational success. If this procurement manager succeeds with his three quotes, the budget was, I'll use Uganda shillings, 300 million, and he gets the pro property at uh, 299 million. He's still, there's organizational success because that was budget. But most times you'll find that this has been inflated. The, the uh, item was probably 100 million. So the issue with governance is how do you then carry out processes in an effective and efficient manner so that your, your success is effective and efficient. So corporate governance is not that sort of concept out there. It is within the organization and the cultural component, I was glad you, you mentioned that earlier, is what culture do we have? And that culture will tell you, do we have good governance? Do we have bad governance? So aside from the compliance components, the culture comes in. And this is everybody taking part, not just the secretary. So including the in-house lawyers, but everybody, governance is everybody's responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Rita, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Um, I mean, Gloria, what you're talking about is not something that is unique. I, I think over the years, the teams that I have worked with, I have almost had to have this conversation with almost every lawyer that comes into my, you know, I, I studied law, I want to be a lawyer, you know, that's, that's what I like, that's what, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's an opportunity to contribute at a level dare I say that even as a head legal, you will not have the opportunity to contribute. Being an advisor to the board, yeah, puts you in a position, one, to become an influencer. And I think for all of us as professionals, you want to grow to the point where you're not the policeman or woman. The head, the in-house lawyer role is well complemented by having a governance-like approach to things. Because governance says, I understand that this is business and I understand that it should be run well and it should be run sustainably. And I want to contribute to that. The thing about being an in-house lawyer who is very limited, this is my other challenge to in-house lawyers who are like, it's, it's very much, I want to do in-house. I don't care about that governance stuff. We just talked about the trends. We talked about where the world is going, okay? Um, we talked about we, any in-house lawyer who's done a training on being an effective in-house lawyer knows that you're told you should add value to the business. You have to be business, you know, business add uh, value. Now, if you're doing in-house law alone, 
you may be useful, but your role is very much seen as one that certain aspects can be outsourced, to be honest. And, and, and Jen, I think, you know, knows this. That, and someone may argue that even the CS role is outsourced, not as much, not as much. Yeah, the in-house lawyer role is, 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 is seen very much as specialist, but a specialist that may not really be embedded in a business unless your culture is the right culture. What I would challenge people to do, uh, uh, participants on this call, is allow yourself to actually be curious about what else you, know, uh, you can learn about the way well-governed businesses are, are run. After all, we are all business people. I, I know very few people who are not running family businesses or are not in a partnership of some sort. So it doesn't mean that your law, and, and you can bear me witness, I actually, like I said, now I am more on the governance side. I'm, I'm not the head legal. We have a head legal, but I still practice law. It, it, it goes without saying that you, you, you will not lose that part of what you're doing. So consider that if only because the world is changing, the demands are changing, Commercial value is the new currency for any professional. That is the new currency, commercial value. So you want to add on to that anything that allows you to be a professional who adds commercial value. That's, that, that would be my challenge. That's, that's why I, you know, I, I opted to, to still take on a role where I'm not doing head legal because it still makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. If I forget anything, it's commercial value. That one will be will sum it up for me. <laughs> so I, I would like to open it up to our listeners. Uh, do we have anyone who wants to ask a question before we read the comments on the chat and Q and A? Do we have anyone who would like to ask questions? Ashil, can you help us? Two participants raised their hands, I think. Have Franklin. Franklin. Frank Lilaco. Yes, you have a question. Please proceed. Franklin, uh, you're muted. Franklin, uh, I think you're muted. Ashil, you have some. Okay, while 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 we sort that out, maybe I could read some of the questions from the Q and A. Um, the first one is saying, "What would you make of a decision by a majority shareholder to use the poll?" that is the weight of their vote, not numbers, to elect directors to the disadvantage of the minority. Um, I don't know, either Jen or Richard can take that. And the person says that the, the question is in relation to a hybrid organization government and individual shareholders. That's the first question. The second question is, what do you do when you have a protective CEO who is more connected to the board? How do you break past that barrier? And then uh, the other one is the CS receives papers from management who are of different professions. How can he ensure that the same are transparent? That's a question from, uh, from Christopher. Then Hajat wants to know who is higher, head legal or CS? <laughs> That's an interesting question. So maybe if we start with the first one, uh, does, Jen, do you want to take that? Okay. Um, yeah. the, the, sh the shareholder, the minority shareholder has rights. So if the issues are decided to their detriment or to his or her detriment, first of all, the companies, act, the Ugandan one, I'm not too sure about the, the other, the, the Kenya, Uganda, uh, Tanzania acts are usually the same. I'm not too sure about Rwanda and Burundi, but the act usually provides for that protection of the minority and the shareholder can actually sue on that. There's also what we call derivative action. 
which the shareholder, especially if it's a company decision, and uh, the, the minority shareholder can sue the board members for, for taking such a decision that is, a, that is detrimental to them and probably to the company. So it's a court action. They'd have to go for court action. And they have the power to do that. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rita, do you want to take the next one? What do you do when you have a protective CEO who is more connected to the board? How do you break past that barrier? I think you already spoke to this a little bit, but unless there's something. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think I spoke to this and, and uh, look, all of us, for many of us in our CS careers, you will come across these type of incidences. And, and that's where the EQ that we talked about is very key. And, and a big a challenge that I would like to throw at the company secretaries here is do you actually have relationships with your directors? Because when you have relationships with your directors, there's the informal things you have to say when everybody's there, okay? Then there is what you can say to a director here and there to ask um, for help and guidance. Uh, Jen mentioned this, you have to be very bold in this role. So um, if, if depending on how key this issue is, now there's two issues. One, your CEO is, is your boss and is making your life miserable because he or she is just not a very nice person. You know, I mean, you know, that's the world. Welcome to the world. I don't know whether you want to put your relationship at stake with the CEO to go, you know, and report to the board. But if it's something fundamental, something ethical, like I said, I had that issue with with um, with um, minutes and and things like that. But I had enough of a relationship that I could, without putting the CEO necessarily on the spot, say, um, there's one or two or three issues. Uh, say, for example, when when I use my minutes a lot to help me out, and and you know I hope none of my bosses is here, but um, <laughs> my previous bosses. So Oops. the thing about your minutes is it's a record that binds um, uh, management. So when you write your minutes and you have action plans or action points or things that allow you to carry on a conversation for longer, what do you do with them? Do you include those key parts in your minutes? Because what it helps you to do is to say, you remember the other discussion we're having, Director X, um, there seems to be a bit of a challenge with management, and maybe it would be good to, to have further discussions. You don't necessarily have to put the C on the spot, um, but you, you, you will find yourself in positions where you have to say, I'm having trouble sometimes. If you're not willing to do that, right? You want to maintain the good relationships, but your CE is putting you in a position where you are going to be at, at, at risk of having been party to something else. You have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. You know, I think what I find a lot with very many of us company secretaries, we want to keep the balance. We want to keep the relationship. We do not want to make the CEO mad. Uh, we want to stay at the job. But sometimes you just do not have that call. You have to make a decision. Your relationships will serve you well. If you're the CS walks out of the boardroom as soon as the meetings are done, you never, you don't know your director's uh, children's names. You don't know where they live. You have no idea who they are. How are you going to break the ice when you're in trouble? How are you going to break the ice when you're in trouble? If you're bold enough, you can do it at the board meeting and say, I'm having trouble. But my, my, my way of doing it has always been to sort of find a way. I'll tell you this. In one case, I actually spoke to the CEO himself and said, look, this is who I am. I'm not comfortable with this. I really honestly do not want to be put in a position where I, the board asks me, CS, is it true that management has solved this? And I'm sort of caught, you know, I'm going to go. If, if, if it's a manager, I'm going to tell them, you own up in the board meeting. I don't want to have to be asked that question. If it's the CEO, I'm going to say, look, if I'm asked, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to say? So again, it's not a hard and fast. We, we, we would like to have that, but life is not like that. You have to make calls. Your relationships will serve you well. Build those relationships. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, I, I guess that is pretty clear. We have to manage our relationships. Um, the other question was... Um, maybe um, 
Gloria. Yes, Jim. Yes. There are, and I'm, I'm talking from experience, situations mm -hmm. where you fail to manage that relationship. I had a very weird situation where because the CEO left, the chair stepped in. So I had a chair who was a CEO. And unfortunately, our values were not on the same-ish page. I resigned because I could not live with that. I resigned. So if you cannot manage the situation, you need to make your judgment call. Do I continue with this? What does it reflect of me? I have a reputation I've built over the years. Thank you. So basically managing is not just about staying in the job, it's also about knowing when to quit. That's, that's very powerful, very powerful. So um, Hajat is asking who is higher, head legal or CS? I think we already know that. <laughs> they are both equally important. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the recommended reporting line for a CS? Is it to the CEO, executive chairman, or the managing director? Who wants to take that question? Okay, maybe to, to not put Rita on the spot because she's an active CS. I have since retired from the CS position. Ideally, the CS for that independent component, first of all, is appointed by the board. He or she who appoints is the one, or body that appoints is the one to disappoint. And the appointment and disappointment of a person, of a person should, should then tell you who the reporting person is to. But to make it gentle, because we have to work with the CEOs, issues related to governance, the secretary is supposed to report directly to the chair of the board or the relevant committee chair. The secretaries, access to board members has to be as open or even more open than of the CEO. But then there are other issues that are administrative. If Rita becomes pregnant, she's going to need maternity leave. She's not going to ask the chair <laughs> for maternity leave. So administrative functions, CEO, but anything governance, because the governance role is for the board, it's not for the CEO. Anything related to the governance, corporate governance, they should report to the to the board. The problem then is the CEO feels the secretary has created a power base. Rita talked earlier about emotional intelligence. It is your responsibility as a secretary to make sure the CEO does not feel threatened by your nearness to the board. Your power is through, it's a very powerful position by the way, the secretary, and I speak from experience, a very powerful position. But how do you exercise that power? You must not uh, let the CEO or the rest of the management feel threatened. And that's because of your emotional intelligence. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Rita, somebody is asking, who keeps the secretary in check? Given his, <laughs> his her role, <laughs> how is the secretary protected from the wrath of either the board or management when he does his job well, uh, not to the liking of either of them? So I think it's a two-pronged question. Who keeps the secretary in check? Who protects the secretary? If uh, either the board management is not in alignment with your position. It's a very interesting question. Yeah, that's, 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 that's and those are the dilemmas of life. Those, those actually are the dilemmas of life. Ordinarily, the chair keeps the secretary in check. The assumption here being made that your chair is a person of integrity. Now, again, that's an assumption because chairs are generally supposed to be people of integrity, meaning everything they do will be well-meaning and for the good of the business. So they ask you the tough questions. The board keeps you in check with evaluations. I don't know how many people do evaluations. We do, and they're actually very serious. So the board keeps you in check and will give you feedback about how well you're doing. Uh, even though your C has given you a good rating on the management side, it has to be balanced against what the board's rating from the board uh, side is. And those are two things that keep you in check. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know whether maybe some of us have just been you know, fortunate that there is, always, there is always that one director or so who's, who's a bit more independent than others, who you can speak to. Is it likely that the whole board will be against the CS? 
I don't know, unless that whole board really has, you know, issues, okay? Because if not, um, oops, sorry. Uh, because if not, uh, Jen, I, I mean, uh, you know, we'll say a thing or two about whistleblowing. Um, a very, very sensitive thing that you do not want to do is to rub everyone the wrong way and stay. If, if you know that at a certain point, uh, I need to be protected, who, who do you need to be protected from? If there is no one on the board who really can see your side of things, then I'm not too sure what you're going to be able to do in terms of influencing and driving the right governance culture anyway. So you're staying, but you're staying, you know, in a situation where you really, really do not have much, um, much, much sway, much influence. Um, I know in state-owned corporations, and I'm not encouraging this, but I am saying this, there's been whistleblowing to powers that be beyond the board. I am not saying to do that. I'm just saying that has happened. Um, that's a check that is sometimes used. In very, very acrimonious situations, there's been shareholders who have called out uh, boards because the shareholders appoint boards and sometimes the shareholders are very pro the company secretary if they think the company secretary is looking out for their interests. However, the question still becomes, how will you stay? How will you stay? You know, and how are you going to work with people you can't influence and, you know, your, all your everything you do is being questioned. So there are mechanisms, but I think it's, as Jen said, it's a powerful role. To whom much is given, much is required. The risks are just as high. Um, it's like being a head of internal audit. There are risks. So you, you have to take that, you know, in account when you do take on a role like that. Yeah. Okay. So we have so many questions coming through. I'm going to have to, you'll forgive me for not able to read each, each and every one of them. So, but there's this one that somebody is asking, are the shareholders not bound by the general principles of corporate governments? How can you hold them accountable? We've been talking about directors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're, 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 they're shareholders. <laughs> but the, you, you know what, corporate governance came about, it, it's a very recent uh, concept. It's when there were the, the corporate scandals, late 80s, early 90s, and you have the Enrons. I'm sure everybody knows about Enrons. And what it was found was that the directors were selfishly enriching themselves, falsifying accounts. And, and when the investigations found all this out, the systems crashed. So the issue, and when we, we go into the theories, the agency, Theory. The issue is the shareholders own the company. The shareholders appoint the directors. So the directors are the agents of the secretary to manage the company. In that concept, ownership is separated from control. The owner of the company is not in control unless you are a shareholder. So the corporate governance codes, principles, and all those are used by the shareholders to check directors. Shareholders are not checked. But what would they be checked about when it's their own property? What <laughs> wrong thing would they want to do to it? Yeah. So nobody checks the shareholders, but the shareholders need to check directors because we are humanly and uh, selfish. Uh, our nature as humans is to be selfish, inherently selfish. So some of these principles are put in place to check that. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, somebody is asking about, and I think we've, most of our conversations have been mostly about the private set, the private part of organizations. And the question here is about state corporations. So Jane is asking, how do you manage board dynamics as a CS? How do you ensure that there is room for the CS to enforce this, mostly in state corporations, where there's a lot of political allegiance? So I think here they're asking, if it's not a private setting, but now has the political influence, how do you manage in that setting? I don't know who is best placed to answer this question. <laughs> who can answer that? <laughs> I know Rita is going to say James. <laughs> okay, I, I've, worked in in the, I've worked in the state setting before, and what you find, especially, mm. will be tidy if your board is going to be appointed after elections, because all the 
people of a particular party that many of them that failed will be appointed into boards. No governance practices, no nothing. And then there's that allegiance issue. What impresses me most about the Ugandan state-owned organizations, agencies, is that corporate governance is actually creeping up. I've been on ICSA on consultancy, I, as consultancy for more for a year now, and many of our clients are actually state corporations. And you find that they have board charters, they have a schedule of matters separating what board should do and all that. So it's coming up, but yeah, it's it's difficult. We tell them you need to make sure you have the right mix on the board. They say, but how do we do that? The president is just going to say, so and so you're on the board. Then that's when we advise that that's where you need to use your influence, your influencing abilities, and tell the president this is the kind of person we need. And honestly, if a president doesn't want a sector to die, that, that president will listen. So yes, it's a, it's a difficult situation for state corporations, but slowly they're catching on with corporate governance issues as well. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rita, you yes, yes. If, if, if I could just add something to that. Um, part of the work that I did in, in my former life was actually around state-owned enterprises. And I found out that Kenya has a state-owned enterprise um, code of governance. It exists, okay, specific to how you handle governance issues in state-owned enterprises. So does South Africa. So the Southern African side, actually. And uh, I believe even IFC has come up with one, or OECD, actually, it's Organization of uh, Economic um, Cooperation and Development. So as Jen has said, there's a recognition, even among these corporations, that we still have to do things right. There was a mention today about purpose. We need to remember, we now need to understand that governance has moved from everything being about making money to a recognition that whether you're a charity, whether you're state-owned, you have a purpose. There's something you really want to achieve. And if you don't have good governance, you're never going to achieve it because your, everything is dysfunctional. So there are several people who are starting to understand that and are saying, okay, so in order for us to do that, we have to check management. We have to separate this and that. We have, and when you have a board, that the, the hope is that you have a few of those people. In my work, one of the things that I realized is it helps to engage the, not the line ministries, but um, the bodies under which these state-owned enterprises sit, okay? So how much work is being done? Like Jen has said, ICSA goes and explains governance, not in a, a large corporation kind of way, but in a way they understand, a, a real understanding that even at your level, what governance does is to help you to remain sustainable and to achieve your purpose. As long as that is done, there will always be buy-in, you know? Yes, there are some boards that are totally dysfunctional, but many times you will find one or two members on that board who say, but wait, you know, don't we want to do things this way or that way? So engagement and benchmarking against some of those codes actually helps. Yeah, so I just thought I'd add that as well. Thank you so much, Rita. I think we have uh, time for one more question from the, uh, from the chat. Uh, uh, the audience, I mean, your, your questions are overwhelmingly too many, but I've been trying to, to figure out which ones have been responded to, and I kind of feel most of them were, uh, were touched on. But there's this interesting question from um, Anonymous, who's, who's asking, how would you advise an external CS who is not normally on ground, that means they don't sit in the organization, to effectively run this role? That's a very interesting question, I think. I think we've seen a bit of that. How effective is such a CS? Jane, Rita, both of you can answer this question. <laughs> More effective than people give them credit for. I know, I know, I, I, I used to be one of those who thought they couldn't be effective. Now I will say in-house is way more effective. Let's, I mean, hands down, let's, let's agree. If you're in, you know who sits where, who, who stays until what hour and you can go and sort of say, look, we need to get this done. Your report is late, it needs changing. Uh, you have a relationship with the CEO. However, it's been found 
know that sometimes the advantage of being external is you can call them out, depending, because remember, they also pay you. So there's, there's, there's a balancing act there. But I know a CS who is actually external, who said to me what she has done is one, she is so on top of the industry. She reads everything about that industry. She really understands it and has used that as a way to build her own relationships with the managers. If you're an external CS who only goes in to write the minutes and you get out, you're going to have a problem. You have no relationship. So how will you sway? How will you advise? But if you are seen as very much an integral part, then you will still do well. There is a farm in Uganda that has nailed the art of being external and still external CS. I will say again, still better if you're in-house, but this is what they've done. They've hired former in-house company secretaries. So they know what needs to be done. Yeah, they know what needs to be done. So, you know, again, pragmatic approach. Uh, if, if you're one of those firms that wants to do that, you will not have the advantages of being in-house. And Jen, I think, can speak to this because we've done something at ICS or not. There are advantages and disadvantages, but you can overcome quite a bit of those disadvantages by how you structure yourself and how on top of the industry you are. And probably the only thing, and I, I agree with Rita, uh, of course, in-house is more effective, but we cannot do away with outsourced secretaries. Aside from the advantages Rita is talking about, not all organizations can hire or afford a full-time CS. And yet many of those organizations, all organizations need those kind of um, services of the CS. What is important for the external CS is to understand that it's a position that attracts liability. They are officers of the organization. So if anything is going to happen to the board, if they're going to be, if you're a government, you're going to be called to PAC or a parliament or if a private company and you have some liability in court, you, the outsourced lawyer as secretary, will be part of it. So it's important even as you're outsourced to make sure you are a master of everything within that organization. Thank you. Ladies, um, amazing. I, I kind of feel I have learned so much today. I, I'm not even sure what I'm doing as a CS anymore, <laughs> given these discussions. But as we slowly come to the conclusion of, of this webinar, uh, I would like to hear your final thoughts on, um, on this topic. What are those things that maybe you wanted us to hear that we have not really touched on or have not been asked? Like, what are your parting shots uh, for our viewers today? Jane, you want to go first? The first shall be the first. <laughs> okay. Um, what uh, I, I'd like to emphasize is that governance, corporate governance, is not some foreign concept that the secretary work, uh, works on. It's something that is should be incorporated within the framework of the organization. And actually, it is. When you look at your organization, you, you'll be able to distinguish, do we have good governance or bad governance? Everybody has governance. So what I'd like to, my parting shot would be, these values that we have on the receptions and in the boardrooms, as secretaries, what are we doing to make sure this is what is followed? Let me give a, a small example. I went into the website of Java's, Java's Cafe in Uganda. It's a fast food organization. And I Googled, I, sorry, I searched for the word values. And the only one I got was that we value you. There was a time somebody posted on social media how they had a rat smoothie. There was a, a whole rat managed to get into their cup. My God, even before Javas could say anything, the whole public almost stood up at their defense. This person backed out. I'm sure their intention was probably to go to court or something, but they backed out. Why? Because of the value. Java says we value you. They actually, their culture follows what their values are. You, um, just another small example. I, I, I go to Java's and I'm one of the people who, I didn't put it on social media, but I continued having smoothies there. But there's a time I, I paid, again, Uganda shillings, 20,000 more than I should. I was in the car park leaving. 
The waiter ran after me. Madam, actually gave it, I told her to keep it. So you paid more by 20,000 shillings. You see, so what is it that we do that reflects those values? And that is very much part of corporate governance. It's the culture, the ethical culture and the culture that ensures that the values that the board approve is what we practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Rita, your parting shot. Um, to every company secretary who's present, you are the game changer for board effectiveness. You're the game changer. There is no way that board is going to be effective without you playing a central role. It is not just about having the right people. It, you know, we all go out and look for the best board members. It's about making sure the group dynamics is right, the focus on the substantial issues is right, and all these other things will happen once we have that. So you cannot, I, I, again, I part with Ram Sharan because I absolutely love this man. He says the board is part of the competitive advantage of a company. How much value do you think you can add if you look at your role as I have to make this board effective because it is the competitive advantage that this company needs. It is not just a bunch of people who come to drink tea and feel important. I don't see it that way. You are the game changer, you are central. However, you yourself must change with the trends that are happening. You yourself must change. You cannot be the tea lady, the, the minute taker. You cannot complain about being that if you're not being something else. You will be that for as long as you do not push to be something else. So challenge, challenge the company secretaries on this call. You drive your board, you drive your board and your board will respond as long as you do things in a way that works. If that board does not change, I don't think that's where you belong. Certainly not in the CS role, maybe in other roles, but not in the CS role. The name of the author is Ram Sharan. Um, and his book is Ram as in R-A-M, C-H-A-R-A-N, Boards That Deliver. And the other is Boards, it's simply Boards. And it's Patrick Dan. I am told that's how it's pronounced, D-U-N-N-E. Those are life-changing books about Boards and Purpose and all that. So yeah, enjoy the reading. It will, it will cause your mindset uh, shift. So thank you, and thank you for having us. Jane, I think we've behaved, right? Yeah. <laughs> I thank think you. you've been very good girls. <laughs> thank you so much, ladies. This, this was a very, very insightful webinar for me. Um, I, have, I have so much to take in. I'm sure even our listeners do have a lot to take in and to think about. And uh, I also want to thank uh, ELS for this opportunity to have these conversations. Um, it's, always, uh, it's always great to to look, to look for distinguished guests like you who bring a lot to the table. On that note, I would like to thank everyone who has been with us this afternoon. Thank you for staying with us. Um, I hope you each taken something from this, uh, from this webinar. The webinar will be shared to you. It's being recorded, so you get you each get a recording in your, in your emails. Uh, thank you so much, and um, God bless you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for being a great host. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, participants. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank, thank you, you. Rita. Thank you, too, Gloria. You've been great. And thank you to the thank participants, you. too, and Rita, my co-presenter. Thank you, ladies. Bye.